What does it mean when we say biblical manhood? That's the topic we're going to be addressing today on Flourishment. I'm your host, Tina Yeager. I cannot wait to introduce you to this exciting new guest that we have on Flourishment today. We're gonna talk about how he went from being a convict to becoming a clergyman and what he has to say about biblical manhood and fatherhood is going to blow you away. I cannot wait to get started. The man's name is Jerry Duckworth. Welcome to Flourishment, Jerry. I'm so glad to introduce you to the audience today. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, it really is an honor. So Jerry, can you introduce yourself to the audience and tell us a little bit of your testimony and your story of how you went from a place that no one would imagine would lead to a clergyman's calling. So talk to us about where you were and how God has taken you from that to really going into ministry. I was born in a Christian home. It was it was nominally so. We didn't um we didn't go to church as often as we should. There wasn't a lot of family worship that went on. Due to that, uh, a number of things happened, but but I, I made a false profession of faith uh, when I was really young. Basically, I got led to through the the ABCs of salvation, admit, believe, and confess sort of thing. And I, I get, I know the, the verses that they pull that from, but uh, for me, I was not born again when I you know, said, I, I want to be saved. I asked Jesus into my heart, all that. I had that happen um, really numerous times during my childhood. I would ask Jesus into my heart. I would go up front. I would say the sinner's prayer. I would sign the card, you know, but, but there was actually never an actual change in my life. I've been baptized two or three times because of that. Cause every time I go up front, they're like, Oh, well, you're really saved this time. So let's baptize you. Oh, you're really saved this time. Let's baptize you. But it never stuck. There was actually, um, no change. And then I got into high school, really, uh, my idol was sports and I was a, a pretty good athlete, but I ended up getting injured, not on the field, uh, just actually just being dumb. I had stolen a little trash truck, basically like a, a golf cart, type trash truck. I, I stole it from the city. I was working there because I got kicked out of school. I was in the uh, Burke alternative to suspension program, the BATS program. Somebody left the keys in one of the vehicles and I was like, hey, let's take that for a joyride. This will be fun. And so I took it for a joyride and next thing I know, it's flipped on me. During this time, I could lift a whole lot of weight. And so I'm like, oh, I'll just lift it up off of me. But I was pinned. There was absolutely no way to get it up off of me. And uh, it ended up, it crushed my foot and I ended up having, uh, I think four surgeries on my left foot. I had a 40% chance of amputation because I got compartment syndrome and it swelled up really big and they had to put cuts in it to relieve the pressure. But I say all that because that was a very devastating moment for me because my idol was sports. I placed my hope, my future, my everything in sports, and I placed my value as a person in sports. And so when I had that injury, when I had those surgeries, I was no longer the top tier athlete. I was still okay. I was still good enough to start, but I was not the the guy who was going to go D1 and possibly to the pros if I really worked hard. I wasn't that guy anymore. And when I recognized that, I realized, wow, I'm not the, I'm not the best anymore. And that took something from me. So I felt like I needed to be the best in something. And so I figured I'll just be the, the best thug, the best gangster that I can be. And uh, I was. I, even in high school, I would go around robbing people. I would do basically any drug that I could get my hands on. Uh, this continued on for years. The whole time, though, I'm saying, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian because one time in my life, I, I said a prayer. Well, it got to the point where I'd stopped doing the, the little drug of smoking weed and doing pills. And I started doing the heavy stuff, the the meth, the uh, opanas, which is basically like synthetic heroin that the doctors give to you so doing all that again professing to be a christian i'm in and out of jail in and out of jail for just small little things and then finally i, I got a big charge they finally hit me with attempted rob attempted robbery with a deadly weapon that was a scary time i was looking at five to seven years 
and I really thought I was going to be gone for that whole time. But God's grace was working in my life even then. Because of that, this five to seven year charge got reduced down. I spent 10 months to a year in prison. And uh, during that time, though, I, I remember a moment where I was thinking to myself, so like something needs to be done. What are you going to do to make a change? And it was either follow Christ or keep doing what I was doing. And I remember being at that crossroads and I was like, well, I'm going to do both. I wanted to have one foot in the world, one foot in the church. I joined this gang. I'm not going to mention who they were or who they are, uh, but I ran with them for a little while because it promised that you would better yourself. It promised that you would have growth. There was laws that you were supposed to go by um, that were like, you know, don't do drugs, don't do this type of thing. So really it was like a salvation by law type thing. However, no one followed the law. No one followed the rules. And uh, really we were just all a bunch of uh, gangbangers who were fronting like we wanted to get better. And it was really like, here's the laws, don't get caught. Here's the rules. If you get caught, we got to beat you up. But if if you don't get caught, then, well, you got away with it. Good job. But, but anyway, so th that's what I was chasing, salvation through this gang. And when I got out, the, the people who was giving me, when I got out of prison, the people who was giving me the good dope was the, the gang members even though the the law the code said you're not supposed to do drugs and so it was really just complete hypocrisy the last time though i got thrown in jail i told myself something's got to change i'm done i'm done with this lifestyle but as i'm in there i'm still doing stupid things i'm still uh snorting tylenol because i don't have actual drugs so i'm gonna snort this tylenol and make myself feel better or i'm gonna uh, snort this coffee they got the uh, instant coffee and a lot of the inmates will line it out crush it up a little bit and snort it and it, I, I would do stuff like that and the guys were like look bro if you're doing that you're not gonna stop doing drugs when you're on the street but I didn't I didn't listen and uh, kept gang banging while I was in there and I, I tried to rob a guy for his canteen I had canteen but I wanted his canteen so I tried to rob him. We got into a fight. Next thing you know, I slam his head off the bars and he ends up having to go to the hospital, get stitches in his head and stuff. And they threw me in the hole for 44 days. The, 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 the holes, the isolation cell, which is six foot by eight foot, uh, basically five steps and turn five steps and turn. And for 44 days, I was in there just contemplating my life. And the third day that I was in there, I think it was the third day, maybe the fourth, somebody snuck me a book. And that book uh, was called Steps to Christ by Ellen White. There was enough gospel in there to reach me. I remember she taught on repentance. And she said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. Uh, essentially, it's better to go to heaven with one eye than to hell with two. And so... I realized I've never approached repentance with that sort of mentality before. I'd come to the point that I truly realized I was lost. For the first time, I told myself for years, I'm saved, I'm just backslidden. I'm saved, I'm just backslidden. I'm saved, I'm just backslidden. But that was the moment where I realized, nah, man, you're lost. You're not a Christian. Well, I put my, my trust in Christ at that moment. And it was almost as if I could... And I'm not trying to be all hyper spiritual, but it was almost as if I could feel the guilt washing off of me. Like, like John Bunyan, when he sees the cross and, and he gets there and the pack, the weight just falls off his back. I, I felt that for the first time. And during those 30 something days that I had left in there, um, there was a Christian guard. And his name was uh, Robert Parsons, and he would come to me. He's the one who led me to Christ, actually. Um, I actually, I remember asking him, I said, what must I do to be saved? I wanted to say, hey, I want to rededicate my life to Christ. But I remember thinking, no, you have to admit, you have to truly admit that you're lost. And so I said, what must I do to be saved? And he's he's the one who, who led me to Christ. But, but during that time, he would 
during those days when I was in there, he would constantly come and he would bring me a scripture and he would bring me stuff like Romans, you know, eight twenty eight. God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And I didn't have anything. I didn't have, I wasn't even supposed to have that book that was snuck me. That was actually wrong of me to have. Uh, so eventually after I read the whole book, I felt guilty and I gave it to the guard and was like, Hey, sorry, somebody snuck me this. I'm not allowed to have this. So really all I would do is meditate on the one verse that would be given to me every day. And I would just memorize that verse constantly over and over and over. I was locked up for seven more months after that because they charged me for uh, getting in that fight. They charged me with assault, inflicting serious bodily injury. During that seven months, God really, God really worked on me and changed me. I spent most of my time in the Bible. It was absolutely amazing. Just, just me and God, but people knew that I was actually a real Christian and they hated me. I got checked off of every block that I went to. They would be like, look, this dude can't stay in here. You got to get him up out of here, but we're going to whoop him. I actually had one dude swing on me. I dodged his punch. And I, I promise, I promise God after that, I'm never fighting again. Dude swung on me because I laid my flag down, said I wasn't going to be in this gang anymore. And um, basically said, if you try to sell drugs to me on the street, I'm going to snitch on you. I think that's important because a lot of people who get clean, they, they maintain this mindset of it's me versus the police. It, it, the cops are the bad guys. It's like, no, dude, Romans 13 says the cops are the good guys. They bear the sword so that those who do evil will fear. If you, if you don't want to fear the police, don't do evil. It's really simple. It's really simple. And look, there are bad cops out there and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pretend there's not, but as a majority, they're good. Uh, everyone that I know is good. I, I've met maybe one corrupt cop in my day and if he was doing anything corrupt, he was planting drugs on drug addicts who had drugs an hour before anyways. After after I got out of, of prison, I decided, so what, what do I have to do to stay clean? And I meditated on this the whole time I was in there. I said, Psalm 1 says that I need to walk with godly people. Don't walk with the ungodly. Proverbs says that if you, the companion of fools suffer harm. So I got to get rid of everybody in my life that would cause me to walk in, in the way of the wicked, would cause me to stumble, would cause me to sin. So basically I created a new Facebook, only added Christians, got a new phone number, only would add Christians numbers and surrounding myself with the body of Christ. And I, after you know, and that, that really helped me because it, it got me to work with the World Evangelical Missionary Association, where I got to go plant a, a church in New Hampshire, and then where I got to go to Haiti for six months and work there. And it also got me involved with the New Deliverance Church of the Trinity. They were super Pentecostal, just uh, mainly a black church. So uh, that's where I get my worship from. I'm, I go to more of like a reformed Baptist church now. So we're like uh, kind of straight laced, but you'll still see me bebopping around in the front and raising my hands and stuff. So uh, I still got that, the little Pentecostal swag in me, so to speak. But uh, they, they really worked with me. Basically, I was homeless during this time. They worked with me to help me become the man of God that, that I am today. There were problems, though, and it, it, it made me sick. I felt nauseous seeing this type of stuff. That was when I felt the call right there to, to pastor. I'd felt it before. I thought to myself, you know, I would love to be a pastor. I felt that, you know, I aspire to ministry. I aspire to ministry. But right there, I was like, I have to do something about this. People were being led astray. I have to get into the pastorate. So I came home from Haiti, was basically praying to God, what do you want me to do? You want me to go back to the mission field? Let me know. And uh, basically that same week that I prayed that prayer, the interim pastor's wife came to my mom and was like, I think God's put it on my heart to tell your son about Fruitland Baptist Bible College. And so I joined there. 
in January, and they've really trained me up well since then. Uh, I joined Grace Baptist West Asheville around that time, which is where I met my wife. And now I'm going to Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, working on my bachelor's of pastoral ministries. I graduated from Fruitland with associate in Christian ministry. Now I have two vehicles, a wife and two kids, and all of that from being a homeless drug addict. I appreciate your testimony, Jerry. That is fantastic. Fabulous. I'm hearing a couple of really key things that I want to make sure that everybody noted. It took somebody really reaching out to a person who may have otherwise seemed hopeless and being willing to invest in you for you to come from a place where you just wanted purpose and you were looking for purpose. You were looking for excellence in all the wrong places. And I think a lot of men when they're looking for manhood and what defines manhood, they have a tendency to look at what am I doing that is better than what other people could be doing? What am I doing that puts me apart, that makes me seem like I'm achieving something, like my life has some sense of accomplishment? And you are finding accomplishment first in sports, and then you are finding that accomplishment met in the gangs. They do really bring you in for belonging and accomplishment at the same time. So somewhere in between there, a lot of men find themselves drinking salt water from those kinds of springs, really looking for purpose and accomplishment in all the wrong places instead of what God made them for. But at that point, when you realized this was not working, this was not fulfilling, somebody reached out to you and they found they found potential where normally people wouldn't see that. Can you talk about how important that is to you now that you're in ministry? So I love the way that you put that drinking salt water, basically drinking from the wrong the the broken cisterns. The the first key thing I think was me being born again. Uh, I had to be a new creation. I had people reach out to me all the time, and I would I would accept their help. And they, they would be the kindest people in the world and really stick with me, but it wouldn't do anything because I didn't have a heart that could receive it. They would sow that seed, but I was, it was landing on the stony ground. So, so really I needed my heart changed. And so when God did that, that it made possible for there to be a, a, a long lasting change of progressive sanctification in, in my ministry. Now, a, a huge part of what I, what I do when I go into these prisons and work with the guys first I, i'm sharing the gospel with them because i know that the gospel is the power of god unto salvation they look hopeless they really do we know that there's no one so far away that the arm of the lord can't reach out and save them and so first we give them the gospel because we know that that the gospel will change their hearts which will result in changed actions but at the same time even though i was a new creature in christ i had a long way to go i still got out homeless and thank God that my grandma invested in me and allowed me to stay at her house for a while, that she would sow into my life in such a way. And so my encouragement to the audience would be, if you see someone out there who truly wants to change, they desire to know the things of God. If you see that, then extend the hand to them. Don't give them a handout. Give them a hand up. Give them the opportunity to work hard to better themselves. Because when you're that low on the totem pole, it's hard to, to even climb up one step. When you don't have a car, when you don't have a job, when you don't have a house, it's really easy to tap out because there's you have to get so far. And to the, to the addict who's struggling or the, the ex-addict, to those type of people who, who've escaped addiction but are still trying to like figure out how what am I supposed to do in this life I, I'll say this take your time and so, some people that get out there and they work 60 hours a week trying to kill themselves trying to you know fight their way claw their way at the top take your time or you're going to burn out do it slowly and surely over time take one little baby step and one little baby step and one little baby step because it takes a lot to really grow into a new person. And if you just try to sprint into it, you're going to fall flat on your face. But when you do fall flat on your face, just get up. a proverb that really blesses me is uh, the righteous fall seven times. 
you know, that's encouraging. The difference is, is the righteous man gets up, whereas the wicked man, he just lays and wallers in the mud. That's a good point. And on either side of that, there's nobody but God that's going to know exactly when that moment of transformation is going to be. So keep giving those hand ups because you're not going to know yourself without the the revelation of the Holy Spirit, whether somebody is at that point of transformation or not. People cannot see that. Only God can see that. So don't feel that a failed attempt to give a hand up means that you shouldn't try again. And for the person who has rejected those hand ups or pretended to be at a place of transformation, don't let shame keep you down when it's really your time for transformation. And it may be, like you said, that seventh time where you've turned back or the 27th time where you've turned back that gets you on the path that God really has you to go on a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. Definitely. And I will say though, I want people to keep reaching out, even if they feel like uh, this person can't be helped. However, you got to have a little bit of discernment too, because yeah. there's people who prey on Christians. They're like, where's the Christians? I got to get my money. Where's the Christians? John, I've heard John Piper say, well, if that's how they want to live, so be it. Just, you know, just give them some money and be nice to them anyways. But personally, I don't want to enable that person. Yeah, that's a good point. You don't want to be enabling people by giving them money or giving them things that they could use to further a situation into self-harm and sabotage that they're not really capable of withstanding. So if you're helping people with a hand up, that may be a word of encouragement, pointing them to an organization where there's structure around that but not giving them money or things they can resell that would actually, you know, further their addiction issue. So be careful what kind of hand up you're giving and that it's really a hand up. How can people stay in touch with you and get connected with your ministry? My email is j.duckworth. That's j.d.u.c.k.w.o.r.t.h. The number two, the number zero. So j.duckworth20 at Fruitland. It's right here on my hat, F-R-U-I-T-L-A-N-D dot E-D-U. So j.duckworth20 at fruitland.edu is the way you can uh, email me. I have I have a book that I wrote. I wanted to be able to share the gospel with, with people in prisons that I couldn't necessarily get to at the time because of COVID. And so I wrote this book called From Darkness to Light. Uh, you can find that just by Googling From Darkness to Light by Jerry Duckworth. I have a really long subtitle it's uh, the intricacies of the gospel explained in a succinct manner in order to bring about the conversion of souls in our second half of our conversation with jerry duckworth i want you to dive into what it means when you say biblical manhood and give us some practical ways that men can apply that to their lives if they're listening and begin to take steps in that direction and avoid some of the things that you fell into when you were going in the wrong direction. Biblical manhood. The key thing we need to understand is, is who we are as image bearers of God first. There's a substantive aspect to that as well as a relational or representational aspect to that. For the substantive aspect, it lets us know why we do some of the things we do, why we think the way we think, why we feel the way we feel. So God is creative. Therefore, making us in his image, he made us to be creative beings. So we want to create things. God is love. Us being made in the image of God, the substantive aspect is we have the capacity to love on a level that the lower creations like animals do, does not have the capacity to love. God is rational. Therefore, we are, we are, we being in the image of God, we're thinking beings. We have the ability to think about thinking, which no other uh, creature on earth does. So we have to understand who we are substantively first. God created us with the capacity to love, to uh, think rationally, to do logic and to create. And then we need to understand who we are relationally and representationally. We were created to be in a relationship with God. We were created to love God and to enjoy him forever. When we have that in mind, we we're supposed to love God and to enjoy him. And, and we enjoy him by doing what he created us to do, to, to love, create, 
and use our brains. So that's why it says to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We love him with our heart, with our feelings, with the very center of our being, with our mind, with the way that we think, and with our, our, our strength, with our hands, with the work that we do. So that's very important. And then as well as representationally, we have to understand that we as image bearers of God are supposed to reflect Christ's glory. We're supposed to reflect God's glory. And it's like a mirror, like he's the sun and we're the mirror. We're supposed to reflect his glory. Now at the fall, something really bad happened. That mirror was shattered. The, the image of God's still there. We still love but we do it wrongly because we're sinners. We still think, but we think illogically and we don't think rationally because we are sinners. Uh, we still create, but we use our creative powers for evil. So that image, uh, which was broken, had to be mended. And so Christ, the, the image of the invisible God, came and was broken on our behalf so that we can be conformed to the image of Christ. At the cross, a beautiful thing happened. Christ took the sin of, of the world of, upon himself and was, was punished in the place of all who would believe. And, and then he offers us his righteousness. But at the same time, he, he not only do we have this great exchange of uh, where, we can have, where can, we can be justified, where we can be right in God's sight, but because Christ rose from the grave, we can have a resurrection ourselves spiritually. And then at the end of time, we can have a physical resurrection. But here, temporarily, when we have this spiritual resurrection, that brokenness, that shattered mirror begins to mend back together so that we more adequately reflect God's glory. So number one, the key thing is, is we need to know who Christ is because that helps us be what we were designed to be. And that is thinkers, creators, and lovers of people. That's a really good, succinct way of describing what all people, all mankind are. What is different about biblical manhood and fatherhood compared to the world's description of what it means to be a man? The difference is, is vast. To the world, being a man is getting a lot of money or getting as many women as you can. But really, all they're really doing is they're not disciplining themselves. They're giving themselves to their animalistic, their baser desires instead of trying to, to look like Jesus. Whereas the Christian man, Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In other words, we're supposed to sacrifice ourselves for our wife and our children. That's what true manhood looks like. Manhood doesn't look like getting 500 women. It's it's getting one woman who who you you're going to love for the rest of your life. You make a covenant with it's having a bunch of kids and raising them up in the fear of the Lord and teaching them about Jesus so that we can go and and drive out the darkness. That's the huge distinction in my eyes. I like that way that you described that. So what are a couple of tips that you would offer to men who are trying to be more like Jesus in the way that they are representing themselves as men and as fathers? What are a couple of things they can start with to start applying to their lives to make that happen? I would say the first thing that you need to do is be a member of a local church. Uh, Hebrews 13 17 says, obey those who rule over you for they watch out for your soul. Um, it's talking about the pastors there, obey your pastors and be getting discipled. Secondly, one of my buddies likes to say, um, if you're single, get married. If you're married, have children, raise them to love Jesus. And then when they make a profession of faith, then you can baptize them. And an another thing for the, the fathers out there, this is the most important things to do family worship. Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Shema. Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as a frontlet between your, 
your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Basically, everyone who steps into your house needs to know this is a Christian household. And me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You need to lead your family. You don't lead your family like a, a tyrant. You lead your family by, by doing family worship, by teaching kids how to love Jesus. And it's real simple. Just cut on City of Light. We'll listen to two songs by City of Light every every night. We may read a small little Bible story because my kids are young. They can't sit still very long, both of them under two. We'll just read a little Bible story and then we'll pray together. Fathers need to be doing that every night. And so with that second one, I just wanted to kind of clarify about the single get married. Don't just get married to whoever. And if oh, you are sure. in a place, if you're in a place where you are not going to be able to have children, or it isn't in the cards where you're in a place where you're in a relationship that God would lead you to be in marriage in that season of your life, there are ways to be a mentor to the people around you and to take up that role in the family of God and still do family of worship in the family of God, whether or not you're like getting married and having babies, like that kind of fatherhood, there's still always opportunities, just like there's for m women who aren't going to have children necessarily. They may stay single. That may be what God calls them to. But if God has called you to be single in your season or for your life, that doesn't mean you're in sin. It, it's just looking right, for right. ways to still pass on that legacy of faith in a type of fatherhood. Is that kind of more what you were meaning by that? Well, we make disciples in two different ways. We make them fiercely, like Jesus said, go make disciples of the nations by sharing the gospel. So uh, Jesus says that those who are in my family are my brothers and sisters and my mother. That's those who, exactly. who believe in me. And so there's two ways that we add to the family of God. Number one is, is we make disciples by sharing the gospel. But number two is by having a family for the people who, who can't have kids. Maybe you could adopt. There's a lot of kids out there who need a home. If you do have the ability to adopt, adopt, please. Growing the kingdom in whatever way God calls you to do that, whether it's through fostering, adopting, having kids that you raise in the Christian environment that you create in your home is a key. So I really appreciate you offering your insights on this today, Jerry. How can people stay in touch with you and support your ministry and get a copy of your book? They can stay in touch with me by contacting me at j.duckworth20 at fruitland.edu. That's j.duckworth, the number two, the number zero, at Fruitland. Edu. They can also get my book by just Googling From Darkness to Light by Jerry Duckworth. Well, I appreciate all of you listening, really giving your ear to Jerry Duckworth and hearing his testimony and listening to his insights on what biblical manhood means. I hope that you'll go out and get a copy of his book. And of course, I hope that you will hit subscribe and come back for the next episode of Flourishment. <music>